Pegboard sounds like a good idea until you start using it and find its flaws. In this video, I'm gonna show you what I use instead of Pegboard. I'll give you some quick organization ideas that you can copy. And since organizing your shop can get overwhelming, I'll teach you a simple framework that you can use that will help you decide what tools go where fast. And the best part of all this is when you take this approach, you become a smarter and more creative woodworker who is satisfied with your hobby. That's right, this video will magically turn your shop into satisfaction city. Not really, but it will give you some genius ideas. This episode of Witworks is sponsored by Policy Genius. Setting up your shop and laying things out is an entire build in itself. For me, it can become overwhelming because I don't wanna waste time and I often don't know what I want or what I need, where to start, and I usually end up being frozen. But a few years ago, I stumbled upon the framework of first order of retrievability from Adam Savage and it's been a simple game changer for me. Now, there's not a one size fits all solution for shop, layout, and organization because every maker is different. Adam has this great quote. The the shop that works best is the shop that is sculpted to the proclivities of the maker that is using that shop. Proclivities. When was the last time you used that $15 word? Here's how I distill down first order of retrievability. Basically, the tools that you use every day, the mission critical stuff. You want them at your disposal, meaning you don't want to have to move things around to access them. There are few things worse than being in that flow state where everything is clicking and you're having a good time building with nothing in the way. And then you need to stop and go search for a tool that you need. Five minutes later, you're digging through your 20th drawer and you finally find that pesky drill bit. That inefficiency and friction can kill the joy of making. Here's how you can start using this framework. Think of the most common tools that you use in every project or every day and find frictionless ways to store them out in the open, not in a drawer, not in the cabinet, so that your hands can grab them within a second and then put them back. That's first order of retrievability. Then there's second order, which most don't talk about. Second order would be things that you occasionally need. The lead for your pencil, that special combo square you only use in certain occasions, the specialized router bit, etc. Those are good for drawers. I'm sorry, draws. Then there's third order, which for me is extra supplies that I'll need someday, like those six boxes of nitro gloves I got from Harbor Freight when they had that proctologist sell. For my new shop, I've decided that this bank of cabinets in the corner is going to be home base, and in the center of it will live the marking and measuring tools I use most often. Beside that, I'll put tools like chisels, hammers, drills, pliers, things of that nature that I end up reaching for a lot. If you have a drilling station, you can do the same thing with drill bits around your drill press, cordless drill, so on and so forth. If there's an area you do a lot of glue ups in, store your glue and clamps in that area and not on the other side of the shop, you get the idea. You can go really deep with this framework. I'll link several videos from Adam below the like button so that you can learn the full lesson from the horse's mouth. What a weird saying. Now this holder you're watching me build here was one of the first ones that I ever built when I ditched pegboard and went straight to plywood. But I'm recreating it because the first version was made out of really, really, really expensive pandemic pine, a two by four, and I just felt like a shop should have some humility to it. So I'm throwing out the old expensive two by four and I'm going with a more humble walnut version. This holder was one of the most satisfying things that I came up with. I saw it somewhere online and figured out how to make it myself. And all you really need is a table saw or a bandsaw and a chisel. Using the geometry of the blade, you can make a nice little holder where it just nestles in and locks like that. So awesome. Now I know that a lot of people watching this are gonna say, but Drew, I don't have time for this. Listen, I disagree. Doing things like this in your shop is one of the most healthy things you can do for your stress. There's a quote that changed my life a long time ago and it says, the person who works with their mind must rest with their hands. And if you work with your mind, doing things like this actually brings true restoration to your body, mind, heart, soul, emotions, relationships. In projects, sometimes in our shop can get out of hand or they can get really busy or expensive. And I found that taking time every now and then to just go out and in five minutes making this little thing using two by four off cuts, a piece of plywood, and I've got a rack for all my plywood you can do that in five minutes, 10 minutes. You can spend a whole day doing this if you really want. But the idea here is give yourself some space to just 
play and see what happens. And if you don't like it and you're using scraps, guess what? You just had a good time and didn't waste a whole lot of material. Like many people, my first workbench was centered around a 4x8 sheet of pegboard. I quickly grew frustrated with it for all the obvious reasons. And then I thought my problem was I didn't have enough of it. So in my second shop, no light, I actually got two sheets of pegboard and I had a four feet tall by 16 foot long run of pegboard that sat mostly underutilized because I realized I actually don't move my tools around a lot. I will work on laying them out where I think they need to go and they pretty much just live there. Plus I hated buying all the different types of tool holders for pegboard. And around that time I discovered you could just make your own tool holders with simple techniques like different sized drill bits, using counter bores, things of that nature, cutting out a little slot so that a chisel could slide in, twist and lock in place. And even if you don't have a drill press or have the space for a drill press, these portable drill presses that go on your drill work as well. One tip here, don't buy the cheap ones. Now this is a sticker, basically. It's sandpaper with an adhesive back. Really cool trick. You can just put these on a piece of scrap wood and make a sanding file to get in really tight spaces. I've had this one for over a year. Still works great. I think pegboard is probably a rite of passage for most woodworkers. And I think one reason for that is because you kind of see it everywhere and that's the examples that are put in front of you. One of the hopes that I have for this video is just to show you a tiny bit of what's possible using scrap wood, your imagination, and some really basic tools. Like this is just a square with a rectangle cut out, glued to another square. What do you think it holds? A mallet. This idea is so brilliant. I feel kind of dumb for never thinking about it. I think I saw it on Instagram from Sawdust Woman. Take a block of wood, set your table saw to 45 degrees, cut a few well-placed curves. He's here, he's there, he's everywhere. What I love about that idea is you don't need fancy tools to make good solutions. You just need a drill bit that's as smoking hot like your mom. And you can make a very easy holder for your screwdrivers. It's not that complicated. And we tend to overcomplicate things as makers. But after I installed this, I realized there was a beautiful opportunity to recess some magnets so that I could conveniently store my torpedo level where I can grab it at any moment. At the time of making this video, I have around 62,000 subscribers, which blows my mind because the town that I grew up in has a population of 100,000 people. And in my mind, that's a lot of people. But still, there are people who say that I am a small channel, and I kind of agree with them. And the reality is, the big channels, the real channels, have a wall of expensive red woodpecker squares behind them. And since I'm not one of the real big channels, this is the best that I have. I hope this video has given you some genius ideas for organizing your shop. But you know what else is genius? Organizing your affairs with the right policy. Well, the holidays not only allow us to spend time with family, but they are a reminder of how important our responsibility is to protect them. And that includes planning to secure their future. With a wife and three kids that depend on me, I have had life insurance for the last 10 years, and if something were to happen to me, I have the peace of mind knowing that provision and finances are one battle that they won't have to fight. Policy Genius knows how valuable your time is, and that's why their technology makes it easy to compare life insurance quotes from America's top insurers in just a few clicks. With Policy Genius, you can find insurance policies that start at just $292 per year for $1 million of coverage. Some options include same-day approval and avoid unnecessary medical exams. Their licensed, award-winning agents can help you find the best fit for your needs, and they work for you, not the insurance companies. That means they don't have an incentive to recommend one insurer over the other, so you can trust their guidance. It's no wonder that they have thousands of five-star reviews on Google and Trustpilot. Your family deserves peace of mind, and you deserve a smarter way to find it and buy it. Head to policygenius.com slash witworks or click in the link in the description to get your free life insurance quotes and see how much you could save. 
Thanks, Policy Genius, for sponsoring this video. I have this hammer that was designed by a no-name beginner YouTuber. Yo, buddy. The problem is that this hammer won't stop screaming at me. It's just begging for a custom holder that perfectly fits the curved profile. So I'm trying a new technique using this trace tool. And in the old days, last week, I would have to trace this out, scan it into a program like Photoshop, and then redraw the vector lines. Not hard to do, but it's a process I don't personally love doing. Now, I know not everyone wants or owns a pet shark with freaking laser beams, but if you know how to talk to the shark with respect, you can get said shark to do rapid prototypes using cardboard to test your idea. Then you can take that idea and put it on a material such as 3.8 MDF, like I had laying around in the trash, I wasn't sure if this would work because my mind really doesn't think in three dimensions like this. But first shot, I'm actually slightly surprised with how well this idea came out. I'm thinking of eventually maybe making a version of this using 3D printed technology that could store the faces and the wrench and all that. But for now, I'm satisfied with this idea that came from cardboard to MDF. What do you think? So I don't love it. I like the function, but I don't like the form. But I have an idea. Hey Siri, call the Old Testament cat. Calling Jonathan Cats Moses. Hey Drew. Weird question, what's your favorite color? Uh, red. All right, sounds good. Layla, who the f was that? All right, so I have a hot take. I'm not a Kaizen foam kind of guy. I like Kaizen foam. I have Kaizen foam, but it's so expensive and so nice. I feel this massive resistance every time I try to go in and cut custom holders for my tools. And so here I'm trying something I've never done before. And I got this idea from Dennis from Hooked on Wood. And that is to cut out the shape of your tool on a thin piece of MDF or plywood. And then underneath, let the cushion be a thing of foam. The cool thing about using laser technology is you can use scraps of cardboard to do all your testing and even do a light scoring on paper to test your layout before you dive in. And this is something that I wouldn't even dream about doing with a foam because of the fumes. And when it comes to foam, this is the idea I had. It's just to use the cheapest floor covering that you can find at the freight. And instead of burning into that, I'm just going to use that as the base and then put this outline of all my tools on top of that. Now the one problem with this back area is there's a lot of wasted space. And here's my plan. Using scraps, I made some compartments and this trick is actually pretty cool. If you ever need to get glue out of an area, use a straw. Remember earlier in the video when I threw away that pencil? Well, actually I am a collector of pencils that I'll never use and this is the perfect area for those. For those of you with a keen eye, you'll notice on the left and right side of this drawer, there is another spacer block and it's about half the height of my drawer. And you know what that's for? It's for the most brilliant and simple hack that you can do on any drawer and all you need is scraps. If you have a drawer that is underutilized, you can put a runner on the side that's about half the height of your drawer and using scraps, you can make this little tray. It doesn't have to be complicated. It's just using glue. And in this drawer, it's the perfect way to store some of the other marking devices that I use often. There are people in this world who take very hard and extreme stances on things, and I'm not one of them. I'm more of a yes and continuum kind of guy. And as I get older, I'm realizing that many times more than one thing can be true. And because of that, I've grown comfortable with embracing that continuum. And here's why I say that. Most of this video has been me contending for the idea that you should make your own tool holders and not hit the easy button. But I would also say that there are times when hitting the easy button does make sense. I wanted to get some nice drill holders that fellow YouTuber Chris Burton designed. And sure, I could have made a rough version of it, but in this case, getting some from him that go together in less than a minute and are perfect seemed like a better route. Also, he has the best packaging on YouTube. And for those of you who are firmly in the French cleat camp, who are angry that I haven't mentioned French cleats in this video yet, calm down, this wall will soon be French cleat city. And again, instead of making my own French cleats, I opted to smash the easy button like it was the like button on this video and I called it a day. Now maybe the coolest thing I got from Chris was the sandpaper storage thingamabob. It's well designed and goes together without glue or brads and has built in cleats on it. And if you've seen this purple sandpaper from 3M, you probably know that it's called Cubitron 2. Now I want to show you 
you something that you probably haven't seen and I might get in trouble for this because I'm not sure I'm allowed to show you, but a few months back, I got the pleasure of meeting this guy. He's one of the people who invented Cubitron, this purple sandpaper you see everywhere. He showed me something he was working on, Cubitron 3, but it wasn't released at the time. He took this one inch stick of steel and he sent it into a belt with this new abrasive and then immediately does the unthinkable. He grabs what's left of the steel and it's cool to the touch. This new abrasive works so fast the heat doesn't even have enough time to transfer to the steel. About a week after this, they announced Cubitron 3 to the metalworking community, and I hope that at some point they will give us woodworkers the same stuff. But for now, if you haven't tried Cubitron 2 and this extract sandpaper, you can get a sample pack for as little as $8 to test it out yourself. But be careful, that's what I did, and you'll never go back to other sandpaper. Two years ago, I knew nothing about 3D printing and I bought my first printer. And while daunting, it has become one of the most rewarding things to make. I am constantly looking for things to design and print and install in my shop to hold and organize my favorite tools that I use all the time. Now here's my question for you. I've been thinking about making a video that is the comprehensive guide for 3D printing for the woodworker because there's a lot that you should know. However, I don't know if that's even of interest to people like you or what questions you have. So if you'd like to see a video that breaks down 3D printing for the woodworker in the shop, let me know your questions so that I can get a better idea of how to make the best video that would serve you. And maybe you're not into 3D printing. This is another time that you can hit the easy button and support makers like yours truly who create things for the community.